Well, welcome to the new Biblical Life TV studio. We now have a new headquarters in Seymour, Missouri. And uh, as I'm sharing a few things as we do the video, I'm going to put up some before and after pictures that will be startling, <laughs> uh, to say the least. Uh, this was a church building that uh, they began a new addition, and uh, the church closed down before they got it uh, even close to completion. In fact, it was not as near a completion as I thought it was when we bought it once we got into it. And uh, over the last two months, Mary and I have uh, gotten up at 4.30 in the morning and many times, many nights pulled up at the house at 9 at night. And uh, we've had crews in here and electricians and plumbers and carpenters and uh, we've mudded and painted until we can't mud and paint no more. I know what it's like to, there was one day I was in here sanding and I decided that I was going to sand where I had done the drywall mudding. And so I got tired of, you know, doing it with one of those block sanders and I went and got my electric sander and, <coughs> and it was a complete whiteout. You couldn't even see anything. So I, I learned some things not to do. But I want to share with you what God's done when this building first went up for sale. They wanted 350000 for it. It set empty for six years because there was so much work had to be done to it. Uh, we got it for one hundred twenty. Had a big investment in it. But, once, uh, but now we're sitting in a building that's debt-free. Uh, the insurance company tells us that it is worth six times what we paid for it. And all the glory belongs to God. God has a plan, God has a purpose, and that's what I want. We have, we have a purpose that we're to do in the body of Christ. We are to teach kingdom and to empower the remnant wherever they are on planet earth. And uh, I thought it was humorous. I still have, uh, an understanding the kingdom part 42 still has not been released yet in all these two months. I have, I've probably gotten in about a half hour of editing, and I thought it was hilarious at the very beginning of that session that I say, now that I've gotten off the uh, conference trail, because I had three conferences in three months, that we would get back to regularly scheduled sessions, and then we buy a building and we close down for two months. Uh, we're going to get that one out. I'm going to try to get this one together, but how many know that you have a plan and God has a plan? But uh, I like God's plan a whole lot better. If you have your Bibles today, we're going to go back and we're going to start uh, dealing again with understanding the fruit of the Spirit. If there's anything that I see lacking right now in the body of Christ, especially when you look on social media, it is a lack of the fruit of the Holy Spirit among those that confess themselves to be Christians. <laughs> I've been reading up on some that uh, have done a lot of things, uh, research on Facebook and a lot of the social media. And it actually tears apart society. It breaks down relationships. How many know because you put up a prayer request and somebody liked it does not mean that that was actually prayed over? They think by hitting like, I got it done. Or we think that Facebook is a forum for us to bear our ugly fangs at other believers because we might have a different doctrinal position than they do. And because of the anonymity of the internet, we, uh, what's really there the, beyond the veneer, that many people, their Christianity only goes skin deep, if that deep at all. In fact, I agree with one I was listening to Hagman and Hagman, and my friend Dr. Michael Spaulding was on there, and he said one of the problems we have today is we have churches full of unbelievers. They've been baptized, they've joined the church, but they have never heard the gospel of the kingdom. And because of that, they've never been brought to repentance, and you cannot be saved without repentance. And so we have the world controlling the organized church. Things have got to change. You know, I've also, I also became very cognizant of the last two months with the schedules we had that um, 
didn't have as much prayer time as I needed. And what happens is if you don't get that, because in the last session we talked about that they marked that when the disciples, when they preached after the day of Pentecost, they, they took note that they, although they were unlearned men, they had been with Jesus. There was something different about them. There's something about taking the time to be with Jesus that transforms. And it is not an event, it is a journey. And uh, I have been keenly aware that my flesh uh, has grown some more, even though I've lost weight during this journey, that, um, that my patience is worth thin at times. And really, is, isn't that the purpose of the den of the world, the den of Babylon, is with running and all the stuff that we've got to do, the emails, the phone calls, the nonstop, just going and going and going and going, and how much the world demands so much of our time that we don't have time to fellowship with the Creator. In fact, I believe that one of the foundational truths of the Sabbath is you got to have that seventh day to turn off the world and reconnect to the Creator. If you don't, the flesh will take over. And so we've, uh, we've got to reconnect to Jesus. I want to go to John chapter 15. Yes, I am going to get to the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to get to handle two of them today. But I, I, just, I just feel in my own spirit that not only for myself, but I think for, for anybody that wants to walk in kingdom, this is essential. If you don't get this, you're not going anywhere. Jesus picking up in, in John 15, starting in verse 1, I am the vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch is in me that bringeth forth not fruit is taken away, and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth that it may bring forth more fruit. I heard one Bible teacher say, you're pruned if you do, and you're pruned if you don't. The thing is, the task is to get pruned and not cut off. Now ye are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. Now underline this in your Bible, abide in me and I in you. That is essential in the kingdom. If we don't give Jesus space by abiding in Him and drawing from Him, we create a spiritual void that the Spirit of this world will fill. And when it works in your life, it brings the works of the flesh manifested. It empowers it in your life because you're fellowshipping with the world rather than Jesus. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, you cannot develop the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and you cannot develop true, a true kingdom harvest in your life. Because this is not just talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This is talking about anything that the kingdom can produce in your life. It will not produce unless you're abiding in Christ. If you don't abide in Christ, you will produce a religious harvest devoid of the kingdom, which we have so much right now in the body of Christ because they're not abiding. We have men that know how to work the politics of churchianity, but they no longer abide in Christ. Dr. Judson Cornwell wrote a book on leadership, and he said one of the problems that we have is we have men that will no longer go up into the mountain to fellowship and to have that burning bush experience and to commune with God. They don't want to go up there, but they want to act like they have, and they give, the, they give us the pablum of this world rather than a fresh word from the Creator. It is time once again to learn if we're going to walk in kingdom. We, it has, it, it, Jesus is the epicenter of everything. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to show some things today that unless you're abiding in Christ, even keeping the commandments become empty and vain. Selah. Think about that for a minute. If Jesus is not in the middle of it, it's not any good. Good. 
As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, so no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth how, how little fruit? Did Jesus? Much fruit. The more you get tapped into him, the more you bring. So if a ministry wants to do more, what has to happen? You got to go deeper in the Lord. It's not working physically harder. It's going deeper in Him and abiding in Him. 2018, and I prophesy this in the name of Jesus, anyone who is kingdom-oriented, your priorities are going to change. It's God, family, and then everything else. But what does the world demand? The world demands to be put first. We're going to have to set things in kingdom order. If we don't, it's going to be at our peril. 2018, even though we're standing on the precipice of nuclear war with North Korea, we have a soft coup going on among the deep state against Donald Trump, our president, that the people elected. We have all these different things going on. 2018 can be a year of, of, of abundance and kingdom because God wants to prove to the world that the things that they long and they seek after are in Him and not the kingdom of darkness. Let's pick up again here in verse 5. I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him shall bring forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abideth not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. The world is going to judge in 2018. The world is going to judge ministries that have withered because they did not abide. The landscape is going to change dramatically. Just watch. God is raising up new modalities of, of reaching the remnant wherever they are, whether it's podcasting. I, I stand amazed at what our little YouTube channel and what we're doing on podcasting, where those things end up. God has a way of taking over algorithms, no matter how much Google would like to censor everything of the body of Christ or whatever the search engine is. How Twitter wants to twit us away into a cubby somewhere. God gets into the hands of his people one way or another. He's that powerful. He's that knowing. He's that caring. We hear from people from literally every nook and cranny of the globe that speak English. And many places where I didn't think they would speak English, uh, we're hearing from. Seven, if ye abide in word and my uh, abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, it shall be done unto you. And so many people take that out of context. Ask what you will in the name of Jesus, and he'll give you riches and glory, and it'll fall from heaven like this ripe cherries off a tree, and there'll be gold dust coming and gold bricks and all these different things. That's not what he said. When I abide in him and his word abides in me, it begins to transform me and I begin praying the way that Jesus would pray in every situation. And because that prayer has been drawn from his heart, it gets answered. That's why James said, you pray but you don't get an answer because you ask amiss. How did you ask him this? Because you did not ask in abiding in him. He did not affect you to change what you prayed. Heaven is, the third heaven is an unmovable point. God is unchangeable. That's one of the things that people try to do away with the law and do away with this and do away with that and try to change the gospel and try to change what Calvary did, all these different things. They forget one of the basic tenets of the faith. God cannot change. He's perfect, which means, and, and, and when, you, when you look at physics, something that has reached perfection becomes absolutely static. It never 
ever moves because if it changes one iota, it means it was not in a position of perfection. Okay? Heaven is here and it is perfect. The third heaven, the throne of God, the heart of God is perfect. And what the power and the provision and everything that flows from the throne will only connect to that which lines up with the throne. We do not change God. God changes us. If I abide in Him and His nature and His character begins to flow through me, whatever I ask, heaven will do because what I'm praying actually matches up with the perfection of the third heaven. That's part of understanding of how to move in third heaven realities. And yet we try to use faith so that God can fill your closet with the, with the 500th pair of shoes or, or, the, the, or, or to take you from a Walmart shopping bag to a Gucci shopping bag. That's not kingdom. I, I tell you what, I, one of the things that my wife always blesses me at, she'll go and she'll go end up getting a two or $300 purse for $15 because it was on clearance. And she'll walk away just like, you know, it's like, yeah, this is the way kingdom's supposed to work. Because it's not in things, it's not in names, it's not in status. I found out that the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit can flow great in jeans. That's what I'm watching right now, what I'm wearing right now. I don't need an Armani suit. That's worldly stuff. I've seen my friend Russ Dizdar now. When, when we were down in Branson, uh, it, it, was, it was middle of summer, it was hot. What nobody saw is he was wearing Bermuda shorts, but he was wearing uh, a tie and shirt and jacket from up here, but he was wearing sandals and shorts where the, behind the pulpit where you couldn't see. That's the nature of TV and everything else. And you know what? The anointing flew, flowed just wonderful with it. We, we think that if we get the lighting right, the seating right, if I wear the right suit and have the right jewelry and have this, that, and the other, that everything's going to flow right. I tell you what, I could be standing here in a t-shirt and a pair of shorts, and if my heart's right, the anointing of Almighty God will flow. Jesus did most of his preaching on a beach. Come on. You don't wear your finest down to the beach or when you're working as a fisherman. We, we, we need to break these mindsets that wherever we are, if I'm connected to Him, He can touch, He can move. And part of 2018 is learning how to walk in these third heaven realities because it supersedes the authority of the second heaven and everything in it. That's how you walk above principalities and powers. That's what it means to be seated in Christ. It's not this fleshly thing that you can command angels and do all this stuff. It's that He is commanding you and you're under no other authority but Him and all of you line up with Him. That is how we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Because when I got born again, it reconnected me to the third heaven. And the part of the sanctification process is learning how to walk based upon the spirit rather than the flesh or the carnal nature. Now the word here abide. Let's see, did I read verse 8? Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. When the kingdom starts manifesting in you, the Father is glorified. If the kingdom is not manifested in you, does the Father receive any glory? No. Here it is, my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. I am fellowshipping, I am abiding with Messiah, and I, and I begin disciplining my life based upon who he is. Now this word of abide in the Greek is mino, which means to remain, abide, in reference to place, to sojourn, to tarry. I like this one, not to depart. There's a, there was an old priest named Brother Lawrence that he, he began developing something called practicing the presence of God. And it was outside his prayer chamber. 
that he tried his best to keep connected with that heart of prayer no matter where he was, and it transformed his life. Because if I abide in him, I don't go into my prayer closet and then disconnect when I leave. I go in there to plug in and to stay plugged in so that as I walk this world, I'm still drawing from the vine. I've got to learn to abide in him. Fellowship or abiding with King Jesus is the only way to learn to function in third heaven realities. We need to remember that weeds spring up because a garden is not tended to. Anybody ever have to plant weeds and and cultivate them and fertilize them to make sure they grow? Let me tell you something. The flesh can spring in up at any moment. Well, that's one of the things I've noticed about weeds. They grow quick, too. They'll grow overnight. Just, and they're there. That's the way the flesh does. Fruit must be cultivated and tended to. And we have seen many orchards over the years that used to be wonderful orchards that that produced all kinds of fruit, but because of years of neglect, died and withered up. I love here what the, this is a quote out of the Preacher's Sermon and Outline Bible, I thought was so appropriate here. For the believer has, has been given God's nature. He walks through life bearing God's nature. We, when we got born again, we got a new nature. We just need to learn how to walk in it. God has absolutely nothing to do with sin, not within his nature. Therefore, the believer is not to cave in to the lust of the flesh. He is to walk bearing the fruit of God's nature, that is, the fruit of God's Spirit. So the believer is to walk bearing God's nature. The believer is to walk bearing a crucified flesh. The believer is to walk consistently with his position in Christ. And the believer is to walk free from selfishness, super spirituality, or envy. That's all in Galatians. And see what the Apostle Paul was contrasting in in Galatians was that the Shammai Pharisees were trying to take the Torah and pervert it into something that it was never supposed to be so that these Gentiles could earn their salvation. That's what it means to be brought under the law. And if you look in the Greek, Dr. David Stern brings this out so great. There's this, this one or two little letters in the Greek can make a lot of difference. One means to be brought into slavery where there's bondage and oppression to the law. And the other means that there's freedom with the law. Now, in Christ, there's freedom with the law, not from the law, because the cross did not give us license to sin. It gave us, finally, the license to walk free of sin. And we need to learn how to do that. Now, let's go to Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 22. We're only going to get two of these today. And let me tell you something, studying the fruit of the Holy Spirit does not necessarily produce fruit in your life. No more than studying carpentry for someone who has never driven a nail. Okay? You got to abide in Christ and let His words abide in you. Now, who is Jesus? Jesus is Almighty God come in the flesh. And so if his word abides in you, it's from Genesis to Revelation. I don't want half a word. I want the whole word. I want the full counsel of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against there is no such law or there is no commandment against these. In fact, when you understand the commandments of God, it's actually trying to cultivate them in our lives. And ye that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affliction and with the, the affections and lusts. Now listen to this. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now what he's contrasting here is I have been connected to this third heaven reality, the third heaven, the throne of God. That is a spiritual reality of who I am spiritually. I've been connected with Christ. 
And the, our task is to have that begin transforming the way that we walk. When I start walking with him and allow that relationship to transform me, it begins crucifying the flesh and cultivating something completely new in my life, not the old nature, not the sin nature, not the iniquity force, but the character of Jesus Christ, the character of Almighty God himself begins to take hold in my life. And how many know we need a good shot of that in the body of Christ? Every one of us need a good shot of that in our own lives. What I find interesting is that the works of the flesh contrasted to the fruit of the Spirit. Now, actually, when you look at the Greek, fruit can also mean harvest like all the grain or whatever. But when you look at works, it's because it can be derived from many avenues. You can have a spirit of lust or a spirit of greed or a, or a narcissistic spirit or a perverse spirit, all these different things. And so there are many avenues that the works of the flesh can come into your life and begin manifesting themselves. But there's only one river for the kingdom. And it's the real Jesus. It's not the hippie Jesus. It's not the prosperity Jesus. It's not the whatever else Jesus. It is the Jesus of the Bible that was Yahweh made flesh that walk among us. When I tap into Him, I tap into the river that produces a singular fruit that has many aspects. Just like we know what we know, Almighty God is Yahweh Jireh or Yehovah Jireh, Yehovah Nissi, we sang that today. Or, or Yehovah Shalom, there's, or El Shaddai. There are so many aspects of God. El Gibor, El Elyon. All these different names that we have for God that, that reveal just one small aspect of Him. And the fruit has many aspects because as He begins to move through us, that multiplicity of aspects of the divine nature begin to reveal themselves in us. It's like looking at a diamond and catching it in the light just right. There's this, this whole faucet of, of, of this wonderful light that begins to flow. That's supposed to be you and I. We're supposed to be light in the world. The very first one I want to deal with is love. Love is the first one that there's a reason why the Apostle Paul, we're going to get into this in a minute, it has got to start with love. I got saved because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that those who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Love is the key to the kingdom. Love is the reason that Almighty God, when Adam committed high treason against him at, 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 at the garden, that God didn't wipe them out. You know, he could have come down there and said, I told you you are going to die the day that you ate of that fruit. I'm going to wipe you out and start with another. I'll just start with new clay again. Love would not allow him to do that. What he said is, I'm going to make a way. That's what love does. Love is the primary key that makes the kingdom work. And the moment that you step out of love, you step out of the kingdom. This word agape in the, in the Greek means brotherly love, affection, goodwill, love, benevolence. And it was also connected to what the feast became, especially Passover. The, the Gentiles and the, and the Romans begin to call them love feasts because they took the celebration of Passover and it became the Lord's table. It was to remember the love that Almighty God had for us, that God himself came down and he paid a debt that he did not owe for a sum that we could not pay to redeem us back. It's there. But let's look at what Jesus says in John 13, 34, and 35. Now, we need to set this in context, church. This, when, when you understand Yahweh, or Yahovah, yod heh vav -Heh, it reveals, 
It is known as the Tetragrammaton, the most sacred name of God. Why is Yahweh the most sacred name of God rather than El Elyon, El Gabor, Elohim? Because it reveals who God is at His very nature. yod Hey vav Hey, the God with the nailed hand will be revealed twice. Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben David. At the heart, the most sacred name of God reveals that God, when he, the moment that he created man, he revealed himself by a new name that even the Nechesh in the garden did not understand. He balanced out mercy, which is what Yahweh means. It means the mercy of God. The mercy of God for us cause God to take his own hand and to drive a nail through it for you and me. So Jesus is the one. In fact, in Yeshua, you still have the Yod and you have the Vav in Yeshua. And there's a mystery within the Psalms that people miss, miss overlook. It literally reads in the Hebrew, Yahweh has become my Yeshua. David prophesied, I believe it was David that wrote that psalm, prophesied all those years before that Yahweh would become flesh and become our Yeshua. And he walked among us. He came to his own and they didn't know him. He came to his own creation and they wouldn't have him. You see, we, we don't serve a pantheon of many gods. We're not Greeks. We're not Romans. Quit thinking that way. One God who has revealed himself as three witnesses or three aspects of himself. And even the rabbis know when they look in the book of Daniel, the, the Son of Man is the only knowable aspect of the Almighty, the Ancient of Days that no man can know. And Jesus called himself the Son of Man. He gave the commandments to Moses. He said, go take a pen, write them down. This is the way I want you to walk. And now because he's standing in flesh among them, it took 3,000 years or 4,000 years to get to this place of what he had promised Adam and Eve. 4,000 years it took God to get earth to the place where he could take on flesh and walk among us. And now the lawgiver, which is not Moses, it's God. Moses was a law dictator. He dictated it down. He wrote it down. He was the secretary of the law. God gave the commandments. And now the commandment giver gave us the key to the kingdom with a new commandment. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you, not the way that men love, as I have loved you. That even though you mess up, I show grace. That ye also love one another. And this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if you have love for one another. The God that gave the 613 commandments of Torah stood among us. And he added a 14th to it. Because he came with the keys of the kingdom. He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, and that key is love. In this dispensation, or this, this period of man, it is love that empowers us to walk in the ways of God. Now I'm saying, well, how can I do that? How can I walk in this level? Let's look at Romans chapter 5. Let's look at what the Apostle Paul is trying to share here. Starting in verse 1. Therefore being justified by faith. How many know it's not the works of the law? That saves you. Moses did not come with the Ten Commandments into Egypt and said, do this and God will get you out. He didn't come with one single law. He came as a kinsman redeemer. Sent 
from the presence of God to redeem them out. And only a free people standing around Mount Sinai could be given the law because only slaves cannot keep the commandments of God. If you're a slave to Pharaoh, you cannot serve God. But once you're free, it's only then that you can serve God and have commandments to walk in. So we are justified by faith. We have peace through God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith unto this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. How many of you have God brought, has God brought you through some things? It builds hope on the inside of you. But listen to this. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which was given to us. When was the Holy Spirit given to you? At the point of salvation. When he came in, he took this love that Jesus spoke about and he released it into your spirit. And when I learn to begin moving in that love, it'll start having me do things that I wouldn't normally do. And when I start doing things, guys, this is important. How many of us, it's 99% of the time, it's stuff that we do to get us in the bad situations we're always in. And the only way to change that is we got to start doing different things. Because when I draw from the works of the flesh, the anointing of hell flows with it to produce bad fruit. But when I begin responding out of love in the heart of the Lord, there's an anointing with it to produce the kingdom. Accepting his love and completed work on the cross causes the love of God to be released in our hearts. Love is the key to the kingdom that opens the door to being able to walk in the spirit and keep and to keep the commandments of God. Now hear me. You cannot keep the commandments of God without the Holy Spirit. You cannot keep the commandments of God without the blood of Jesus. And you cannot keep the commandments of God without the love of God in your heart. Because the, the cornerstone is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. It's always been love. God showed them that it was love under Moses. But when Jesus came, he was the one who brought the love to be able to walk in it. <clears throat> now let's go a little bit further here in Romans 13, starting in verse 7. Render therefore to all their due, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear is due, honor to whom honor is due. Owe no man anything but to love one another. Now listen to the next part of this. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now we're going to get into what fulfilled actually means there in a minute. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now the first half of love is i got to love God with all my heart, all my soul. I do the commandments because he set me free, and because I love him, I want to walk in a way that's pleasing to him so that he can be glorified. The other side of the coin is because I have been loved, I can now love. And as I love my neighbor as myself, isn't that what Jesus said? The, 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 the law and the prophets hinge upon this. Love God, love your neighbor. Without that, the kingdom won't function. But this word fulfilling here is not pleruu like it is in Matthew when he talks about, I have come to fulfill the law, which means to make it flourish, to make it abound. It's a different Greek word, pleroma in the Greek which means that which has been filled as a ship, as it is filled, i.e., in manner with sailors, rowers, and soldiers, 
In the New Testament, the body of Christ, that which is filled with the presence, the power, agency, riches of God and Christ. So as I walk in love and begin keeping the commandments based upon love, I become a ship loaded down with the fruits and the wealth of the kingdom. Come on now. The problem with most of the body of Christ is we are, we are empty ships because we've not been taught. In fact, our theology has been so against the commandments that we hate the commandments when Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Which is the, the foundational stone to love the Lord that God will. Come on, guys. I've been set free to walk in it, and as I walk in this love, and I begin moving in this love, I become a ship laden with the fruit of the Holy Spirit and the kingdom, so that when I pull into port, now listen to me, when I pull into the port of somebody's life, I have plenty of the kingdom to share with them so that the sick are healed, the blind see, the dead are raised, the lame walk, demons are cast out, and what did Jesus instruct us to say? The kingdom has come near you because I be a ship loaded with the kingdom. Now let me introduce you to Jesus. Let me introduce you to the gospel. Get saved, and now the commandments are about walking in the kingdom rather than the old kingdom you used to walk in. So that you can fill your ship full of the kingdom. I like that. <coughs> without love, the commandments, without the love of God functioning within our spirits, even the commandments of God become hollow and devoid of power and purpose. If love is void in our lives, the empty space is filled by a religious spirit that will cause the commandments to be filled with poison of the kingdom of darkness. How many of us have been in churches when a religious spirit takes over? You just, I don't want none of that. Whether they're Baptists, whether they're Pentecostal, whether they're the commandment keepers, if a religious spirit takes hold, there's something in us that says, I don't want that if you're walking with God. And it causes people to be repelled by the gospel. It's like the old joke here in the Ozarks. You know, if you break down on the road and there's a church two miles this way and a tavern two miles this way, you probably get more help if you walk to the tavern. It's because it's devoid, it's an empty ship. It's an empty ship, it's the love of God. That gets it there. Now let's look at the second one. Joy. Chera in Greek. It means joy, gladness, the joy received from you. The joy received from you. People are running to and fro looking for joy. Joy is found in the kingdom. And then you bring joy with you. What I thought was interesting, too, it can be translated of persons who are one's joy. Now, when, if you're blessed to be a grandparent, grandbabies bring joy. They bring joy. Even though they can come in ornery, rowdy, they bring joy. When I walk in the kingdom... I'm not looking for joy. I am a ship that is filled with joy that other people can drink from. Because when I entered the room, I'm supposed to bring the kingdom with me. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans 14, 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat nor drink. Man, there went the whole prosperity message. 
I mean, just shot it down in flames. Now, does God want to meet your needs? Absolutely. But he's not called all of us to be millionaires. And we've got to understand there's a difference between needs and wants. I found out God can always meet my needs, but wants can be like a black hole. They're never satisfied until they're crucified in Christ. The kingdom of God is not meat nor drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You see, there are billionaires right now on this planet that have no joy. They have no peace. They may have servants. They may have their own private planes. But they're not going to be satisfied until they rule the world. They've got to get all of us under control because they walk in fear all the time. Fear that we're going to eat up everything. Fear that we're going to this. Fear that we're going to that. Fear that we're going to raise up and take their money away. Fear, 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 fear. The only way that wealth does not add sorrow to it is when Almighty God gives it to you because you've given your heart to Him. But the true kingdom, the kingdom within, is righteousness walking in the commandments the way that Jesus would. I like what my friend Dr. Carl Koch, you got to meet with Ariel Sharon before Ariel passed away, and he was wanting to do something in Israel, and, and Ariel said, why are you so interested in the commandments and so interested in Israel and all this stuff? And Carl looked at him and said, because the Jew's living on the inside of me. His name's Jesus. I, when, when, when I accepted him as Messiah, in this old Gentile heart that was foreign and alien from the things of God, the king of the Jews moved on the inside of me, and he likes keeping the commandments. Come on. He begins living through me. That's the kingdom. It doesn't matter if you got a sweep or dirt floor or have the nicest vacuum on the planet to vacuum your carpet. It should not change the righteousness because God's living through you. The joy that you have at your salvation and the peace that we have because we're made right with God. If God be for you, who can be against you? Who can separate us from the love of God that Almighty God Himself would come down off the throne and, and place Himself on the cross to save us? I can't think of a thing that would separate me from that except rejecting Him and His sacrifice. But Paul goes on in Romans and he prays this very powerful prayer. And this is one that you need to start praying over yourselves and over your loved ones. It's in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope, the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of of the Holy Ghost. That's one that you need to start claiming for yourself, praying over your children, praying over those that you intercede for. The God of hope, when there is no hope, God says, I'm the way maker. There's a new song out that talks about Jesus. He's the pain taker. He's the way maker. He's the prison shaker. He's the chain breaker. How many know that's hope? doesn't matter whatever situation we're in, Jesus is enough. The Preachers and Sermon Outline Bible writes this about joy. There is joy, charis, an inner gladness, a deep-seated pleasure. It is the depth of assurance and confidence that ignites a cheerful heart. It is a cheerful heart that leads to cheerful behavior. It's not your circumstances. Circumstances change, but it's what's on inside of you. How many of us have seen people that, that their, their insides are wrong, their, their heart's wrong, their attitude is wrong, and they can receive the biggest blessing that anybody could ever receive, and they can't enjoy it? They're, they're looking for the angle. They're looking for the, the, the whatever, what's wrong with it. It's like the story of two boys that were twins and they were both given boxes. 
And the parents played a joke on one, one of them, they gave him the toy that he asked for, and the other one was full of horse manure. The little boy with the box of horse manure started throwing the horse manure all over the place. His, his dad says, what are you doing? He says, with this much horse manure, there's got to be a pony somewhere. Because the joy was on the inside and he knew what, and so he, he took a box of horse manure and turned it into there's a horse somewhere and I'm looking for that horse. Guys, it, it's, not our, it's not our circumstances that bring joy. It's our relationship with Jesus that brings joy. They give several scriptures here that I thought were important. First one is John 17, 13. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak into the world, that thou might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus wants you to have a joy the world can't take away from you. But it's only cultivated by abiding in the vine. First Peter 1, 8 says, Whom we have not seen, ye love, in whom though we now see him not, yet believing we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know, the Bible says we have been given the power to become the sons of God. We're not there yet. And oh, when you connect it with Genesis 6, Genesis 6 it takes on a whole new dimension. That we are scheduled at the resurrection to become the B'nai Elohim. The sons of God. We do not know what we're going to be like, but when He appears, we're going to be just like Him. And that hope brings joy unspeakable and full of glory. I could do an entire seminar just on that concept. Isaiah 16 10. And I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robes of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and a bride adorneth herself with jewels. I have been given garments of salvation. How many are saved this morning? Joy is a natural product of your salvation. It cannot be given by the world. It cannot be taken away by the circumstances of the world. It's beyond the touch of this world. That's the kind of joy that I'm looking for. Our joy is not in things, but in a deep, powerful relationship with the Creator. And I have found the more I abide in Him, the more love I have. The more I abide in Him, the more joy I have. The more I abide in Him, the more that my ship gets loaded down with the things of the kingdom. Because the law is being fulfilled. The ship is getting full. And people are seeing the fruit of the kingdom in my life. Now, Father, I just take this before you. Father, I thank you that your word will not return to you void, but will accomplish wherein to you have sent it. Father, teach us. Let 2018 be the year of abiding in Messiah. Father, give us a hunger for you. Give us a hunger for your presence. Give us a hunger, Father, to just be that branch that only draws from the vine of Messiah. And Father, it will transform us, it will transform our families, it will transform our ministries. And Father, we'll have something to give to the world to show that Jesus is the only way. And we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name.